Good evening, everyone. Good to see you all tonight. Thanks for coming out, being with us tonight. Hopefully the traffic was a little bit easier tonight than it was last Wednesday. All the telephone poles are still up on High Street tonight, as I suppose the last week. A few announcements for you tonight. First of all, if you have not as yet, we have the table back there in the corner. Those are for our college graduates and uh, some of them with advanced degrees as well. But they're back there and we are honoring them on Sunday. And part of the gift from the church includes notes from church members, just notes of encouragement. That can be a, um, a brief prayer, a word of scripture, whatever. And there's some little cards back there to put those on. So if you'll take a minute, write those. Some of those are people you will know because you've known some of them their whole lives. Others you may not recognize at all, but they've been a part of our college ministry, and we want to make sure that we encourage them as well. So take a few moments and, and write a note or two uh, as you do that. Also, uh, by now, everyone should have received your invitation to Realm, which is our new uh, church management software. And you should have gotten an email about that, an opportunity to, to log in. I know some of you have because I've seen you on there already, and thank you for doing that. Uh, that invitation is only good for, is it 10 days, Nikki? It's only good for 10 days. So make sure you go ahead and do that. If for some reason you don't get there, call us. We can send you another one. Uh, and if you have any trouble with it at all, let us know, and we'll be glad to walk you through it. But so far, folks seem to be getting on that pretty, pretty well. Also, you'll see there, Vacation Bible School is coming up quickly, and so we have a, a meeting this Sunday at 5 o'clock, if you're interested in helping with that, see the information on your sheet there on the table. And then don't forget our virtual Calvary survey, I, we're still, that's still open, right Nikki? And so uh, you can just scan that with your phone, and it's just a few questions, real brief, and we'd like to hear from as many people as possible to get a wide variety of responses. So um, make sure that you take a few minutes and do that if you haven't done that already. Okay, a lot of announcements tonight. I think that covers it, though. Anything I'm forgetting? Okay, thank you. All right, let's take a look then at a prayer list. And we'll give you a moment to review that here in just a minute. Share your concerns around the table. So why don't you do that now, take a look at the list, share what concerns you might have around your table, and then we will uh, have a time of prayer together.
Okay, let's spend some time now together in prayer. Guys, we come together this evening, we do so toward the end of a really beautiful day, and we're grateful for the beauty of this day, for the beauty of this season, the songs of the birds, the colors of the flowers. We're so grateful for all the blessings that you give us. God, forgive us for taking those blessings for granted, for failing to stop and to say thank you, for thinking that they're all for us and not for us to share. And so we pray, O oh God, that you continue to help us to learn how to be good stewards of the blessings you give us in our lives. Certainly, one of the greatest gifts you offer us is the connection to you we have in prayer. And part of the stewardship of that gift is to use it for the sake of others. And we gather tonight to pray for the folks that are on our prayer list, those that we've shared around our tables, and even others that are on our hearts. And we pray that your presence would be real to each and every one of them in this hour in such a way that they would know of our love and care for them, but more importantly, of your deep, deep love for them. And that you would meet the need they have in the moment. That your presence would be sufficient to get them through this moment in their lives. God, we look around our world and there's so much, so much that troubles us and much of it's just simply hard to take in at times. We certainly continue to pray for peace around the world and into conflict and into oppression and suffering. And we know it, it is a part of our shared life on this planet that we have those moments of conflict and we can be unspeakably cruel to one another but we also know that's not how you, how you made us it's not what you want for us and so we pray that you would comfort those who mourn encourage those who are despairing And that you give us a sense of what we can do as your people to be salt and light in the world around us today. Part of that is being about your work, O oh God. And tonight as we look back again to the story of the early church and especially Paul and his mission activity, help us to see in what he did what maybe we can do to lay out a pattern for us of how we can be involved in your kingdom's work in the world. So we pray that you would stay with us now. For to Christ's name we pray. Amen. Much of the text of the book of Acts in the New Testament is taken up with Paul's missionary activity. If you just kind of parse it out, it's, it's, it's close to a, a half. It's at least 40% that's dedicated to telling the story of Paul's missionary journeys. Now, I, I, I take a little bit issue with sometimes with a third missionary journey because it's a little bit more complicated than just a mission because Paul's part of that time being taken Rome to put on trial. So I'm not sure, you know, if that's a mission trip. You don't get a T-shirt for that. Third missionary journey, you know, Rome or die. You know, I don't think that's probably what he had in mind. But the first two of them I want us to take a little time to look at tonight because as we live with those stories, we, we might see a pattern that helps us to understand how we are to engage in God's mission in the world. Now, like I said, it's somewhere around 40% of the text of Acts. We're not going to read all of that tonight, but we're going to take kind of a high-level survey of it. And what I want you to do is, is as we're listening again to those stories, pay attention to the sequence of events. Pay attention to the kind of recurring things that happen every time or most of the time. And then 
I'm going to read the first through the first missionary journey, kind of a, again, not every word, but so that you get the sense of what's happening there. And I think enough to identify these elements I'm talking about. And then we'll stop and see what we've learned from that. And then we'll see what's added in the second missionary journey. Now, if you want to read along, we're starting in Acts 13. And we're going to start, well, seems redundant to say at the beginning, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to start where the first missionary journey begins, which is actually in Antioch. So chapter 13, verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Alemus, the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Alemus and said, You are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. And after the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. And he begins to preach a sermon. I'm not going to read the whole sermon. But it's... It, Similar in theme to what Peter does early on in the story at, on the day of Pentecost. And it's essentially that all the things God was saying God was going to do, God has now done in Christ. Skipping over kind of to the end of that, um, verse 32, we tell you the good news, what God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. And he quotes the Psalms there. And then at the end he says, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Lord, you sco look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. Then they... He go on there and he says after they were leaving the synagogue the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next sabbath so they stay over and on the next sabbath the whole city gathers to hear the word and when the jews saw the crowds they were filled with jealousy and they began to contradict what paul was saying and heaped abuse on him and then paul and barnabas answer them we had to speak the word of god to you first since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The, lo the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Then we pick up in 14, at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. 
But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided, some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding county where they continued to preach the gospel. In Lystra, there was a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth. He had never walked. He listened to what Paul, or he listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted to the, in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and, and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes, rushed out into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in that. Skipping down to verse 19, Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul, dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. And after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day he and Barnabas left for Derby. Then they turn and they're headed back now at this point. Uh, you can imagine maybe after surviving a stoning, you might go back to home base for a little bit. And so on their way back, they preached the gospel in that city when a large number of disciples, then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in the church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and from Italia they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he'd opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples." Now, those of you who were with us last week know that the next thing that happened is the Council of Jerusalem. We talked about that last week. But let's take a step back now and maybe take just a minute to talk around your tables and, and share notes a little bit about what elements did you see recurring there every time? Kind of as they entered each city, there were some things that happened, some things that they did, some things that happened to them and with them each time along. So take just a minute. And, and reflect on what you see there, and let's see if we can't identify some of those recurring elements.
Okay, so let's just, what, let's talk about first how it begins. You know, what, what happens in the, in the beginning of the story that kind of launches the, the mission itself? How does it begin? It's, it's right there. 13.1 talks about that. <clears throat> okay, so if you notice, the first thing it tells us is that they are in worship. And it's as they're together in worship that God through the Spirit says, Paul and Barnabas, these two, set them aside. Then what do they do? They pray and fast, right? Right. So they're, they're praying and fasting, and then they commission them to send them out. So that's how, that's how it begins. They're together. Spirit speaks. These two. And then, then before they commission them, they still pray and fast together. And then they commission them and they send them out. So now we're, that's the beginning, and now, now we're on the road, or in some cases we're on the boat. What happens as they, as they first get started? What's, what are some of the things that now start to happen in every place? <clears throat> okay, yeah. So... They preach first to the Jews or in Jewish places. And that's well put, Michaela, because what's going to happen in this first round is they're going to the synagogues. When we get in the second missionary journey, they actually go like down by the river where there are Jewish groups meeting. And that's still a Jewish gathering of sort, but that's where they start. Okay. So what's the response to that? What? It, yeah, there was an uproar, but it, in some cases, what I would say is it's, it's often a mixed response. In some cases, there's some initial success. People believe. In some cases, there's opposition. Right? Yes. And the uproar, I would say, follows the initial mixed response. So there's a mixed response, and then when there's a little bit more success going on, then there's the real response. And what typically causes the uproar? If you think back to all of, you know, to all of these occasions, what's the, what's the common theme almost every time? Jealousy. So uproar of, often is done because, wait a minute, they're getting attention we're not getting. People are following them instead of us. What are we don't like that? And so initially, it's 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 kind of a grassroots response to that, right? It's not organized. Now in a minute. We get the second missionary journey, it gets much more organized. But in the first one, it's, it's more kind of in, instantaneous. Okay, this isn't going very well. But then what happens after that? After there's an uproar main event issue. There's a change in venue. Okay. They move. They move on to another place. Okay, yeah, they, they're changing. They go from here to here. We, we now, in Paul, essentially says, and if you notice, it's, it's in this chapter where we first hear Paul as Paul. He goes from being Saul to Paul at this point in the story, and it kind of stays that way for the rest of the way. <clears throat> but they go, he does say, well, we did what we were supposed to do. We came to you first. You've rejected it. It, it's interesting. He basically says, y'all aren't smart enough. <laughs> I mean, that's basically what he says. You're not smart enough to choose life, so we're going to go to other people who are. We're going to just move on down the road. 
just dust, do it, kick the dust off our feet and keep on moving. That sounds familiar. Somebody else said something like that. Oh, yeah, Jesus said something like that. And so the other thing that happens, though, even before they, they move on to the next place, is sometimes this uproar actually expands the message. That what happens then causes it actually to be a little bit bigger. There's another element that doesn't happen every time, but also is a part of this sometimes. In some of those stories, something else happened. It's not every time, but it's a lot of the times. Okay, yeah, there's persecution. Mika, what were you going to say? Yes. They're what the, the writer of Acts calls signs and wonders, right? And those have the same kind of mixed results. In some cases, that, that supernatural act engenders belief that's what happens with the proconsul right he he blinds the saucer and the proconsul goes well they must know what they're talking about you know because this happened or we have the man who's called to get up and walk now when you when you start to put a lot of this together it starts to feel a little familiar doesn't it doesn't it feel like the ministry of Jesus? That what they're doing now is very similar to what Jesus did. The ministry looks very similar. We really shouldn't be surprised by that. Because it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit being lived out through Paul and Barnabas, which is the same as the ministry of Jesus. It's, it's not substantially different. The, the mode is different because, well, I shouldn't use that word. That'd get me accused of modalism. The, um, but the, the method is different because it's, it's not Jesus. It's not in, incarnation. But in a sense, it is a spirit living out through Paul and Barnabas. And so there's signs and, wonder, signs and wonders. That's my West Kentucky coming out in me. Wonders, 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 all the same thing. A wonder is a wonder. You can't tell the difference when you sing that song. Right? Um, but it, it's all spirit-driven. And so there are manifestations of the spirit that come out from time to time in these miraculous happenings. And then eventually, they kind of move on, right? Because it gets so bad in some cases where they have to go. You know, they're, they're threatened. You know, Paul's, Paul's stories are interesting. If you just go back and read these mission stories, he gets out of town about every way you can get out of town at some point. Yeah, he, he gets, at one point they lower him, you know, there's this whole story where he gets lowered over the bat in the basket over the wall and all these kind of things. It, it was dangerous to be on mission for God, for Paul and Barnabas, and ultimately Paul and Silas and others. Okay, so these, these are elements. Anybody pick up anything else? What happens as they kind of make the turn back home and they go back to some of the places where they'd been earlier? What happens then? What do they do when they return? They appoint leaders. Okay. They are, they are appointing leaders. They're establishing leaders for the churches. It also says that they're encouraging the brothers and sisters, that they're they're discipling, right? They're going back to them. They've been converted. So they're going back and they're giving them some further support, some further information uh, as they go along. Okay? What happens when they get home? What happens when they get back to Antioch? They got together with the church, and they gave the mission trip report. It's the mission trip report. So, they, you know, Paul and Barnabas put on their T-shirt, and they got up, and they, you know, they ran the slideshow, and they showed the pictures. And at some point, Barnabas said, well, now that's when we thought Paul was dead. That's, that's a picture of Paul under the rocks. We thought he was dead. Wasn't. It was Okay. You know, it's so, so they report back, and what's the response of the church? 
it drives them right back to here, right? It drives them right back to worship. It drives them right back to the place where they began. Now, we know, because we stopped to talk about last week, that all of this activity had another effect in Jerusalem, right? In Jerusalem, they heard about what was happening up there and thought, started talking about, well, I don't know about Paul going to those people talk about that. We need to talk about this. And so then they had to send, you know, some people went out, not sent by the church, but concerned church members. And if, and it probably, they probably wrote some anonymous letters first. And just signed it, concerned church member. <laughs> so, so that they would let them know there was a problem. And then they, well, we better go to check this out. And then we get the whole Jerusalem council. Well, after the Jerusalem council, feeling buoyed by the support that they've gotten, um, Paul and Barnabas get ready to go out again. And that's what we pick up at the end of the 15th chapter. And this is the second of the missionary journeys. And I'm going to invite you to kind of listen for the same things and see what we add to what we've heard. Now, one of the first things that happens is that Paul and Barnabas part company. And they part company over John Mark. Because there's a little detail in the first story. You may have picked it up as we read. There was a point in which John Mark went home. He decided that this particular mission trip wasn't for him, and so he went home. Barnabas was okay with that. Paul, not so much. Paul decides, nope, he left the first trip. We're not taking him back again. You know, it's, it's like the youth minister said, no, that kid did not behave on the first missionary journey. He is not going with us to the Hawaii beach trip. He is, he is staying home. So the effect of that, though, however is that now there are two teams. Barnabas has gone off with John Mark, and Paul has this fellow Silas that he's going to be traveling with, who, by the way, was one of the ones sent by the church in Jerusalem back to confirm that the letter was actually from them to the folks in Antioch, you may remember. And now they're traveling together. And at the end of the 15th chapter, it says, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Messiah, they tried to enter Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to do so. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got, we got ready to, at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Simon Thrace, and the next day we went to the Neapolis, from there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit which predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. And I'm not going to read the whole story there, but you all remember they released her from that spirit 
the fellows who are making money off her didn't appreciate that, and they have them thrown in prison. And eventually, there's the whole story there about the, you know, the Philippian jailer and all that story that, that you can go back and read for yourself. And Paul and Silas are delivered from prison. Chapter 17, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue, as was his custom. Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. <laughs> Sounds like a mob movie. We got some boys from the, from the docks. Um, formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men have caused trouble all over the world, have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They're all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there's another king, one called Jesus. Of course, this caused all kind of trouble. And said, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica heard that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowd, stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea. Then it gets to Athens. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know this new teaching that you're presenting you're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they are. All the Athenians and foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking about it and listening to the latest ideas. I love that. They just sat around and talked all the time. That's all they did. Paul then stood up in the meeting, and he said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar to this inscription, to an unknown God, so you're ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And then he proclaims the, the identity of the unknown God, and that that is, in fact, the creator God of the universe who sent Jesus, who is dead, and then resurrected. After he leaves Athens, he goes to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogues, trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. Silas and Timothy uh, rejoin him there, and Paul continues to uh, work in the synagogue, and to the point where many of the Corinthians, it says, who heard Paul believed and were baptized, and then we get the story of Gallio, the proconsul. We're, again, we're not going to read all of that and uh, through the rest of what happens in Corinth. But Paul has a lengthy ministry in Corinth. And then he goes to Ephesus. And it, he arrives there on an interior road, which means he didn't take a boat this time. And then he stood with some disciples and said, Do you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? They answered, No. We've not even heard there's a Holy Spirit. Paul says, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. And so we have Paul's kind of correction. And what we really see here is, is the beginning in Corinth and Ephesus 
of a consolidation of the theology of the early church. He's correcting some things, pulling some things together, and that's what we're seeing here. In Ephesus, again, there's another riot. Um, Paul continues, again, like he did in the first missionary journey, chapter 20, kind of retracing his steps, going back to places. And then he goes back um, to, to Troas, and while he's preaching there, this fellow falls out of a window. Uh, he falls asleep during the sermon. So this is a cautionary tale. If, if you're falling asleep during the sermon, don't sit in a window. He does say, I, I, do, I do like how, the, uh, how Luke puts it, that Paul was going on and on and on. And he raises him back to life. And then Paul bids farewell and heads to Jerusalem. So, same question here. What, what did you pick up that was kind of added to, different from what happens in the first? Much of it's the same, right? He's still going to the Jewish places to proclaim what's happening. There's opposition, except it's becoming more organized. They're actually following him now. You know, they go from Thessalonica to Berea, and they're following him around. So there's more organized opposition. There's still some who respond, some who don't. There are signs and wonders. All those things are happening. We get leaders. Get, But what, what else is happening this time? What are some things that maybe are added here? Yeah, there's this whole thing with Timothy that I don't, I don't want to get too much into tonight, but it's really interesting that it comes out of the Jerusalem Council, and the first thing Paul does is circumcise Timothy. Well, his mother was Jewish. Yes. I, I think what, what I've always taken out of this story is this, that Paul, in this case, circumcision really didn't matter to Paul at this point. It was irrelevant. And what he was doing was saying, it's just easier, maybe for everybody but Timothy, it's just easier if we do this and we don't have to deal with this everywhere we go. So I'm not taking this uncircumcised Jew with me wherever I go. It's just easier. I think what it actually says is Paul had moved on past it at that point. It was like, this this doesn't matter anymore. And it was just to help move things along. Because then it says, then he goes on and tells them what they decided at Jerusalem. You know, it's kind of an interesting, but I think it's a reflection of where Paul really was. It just didn't matter. And and so he was going to move past it. One of the things at the beginning of the story, I think, though is interesting that shows up a few times in Acts and that's that conflict leads to multiplication. The conflict between Paul and Barnabas, although it's, you know, it's not friendship ending, they, they get back together later, but the conflict between the two of them actually leads to multiplication. There's Early on in the book of Acts, we talked about this a little bit back in the fall, persecution often led to multiplication. They were all in Jerusalem until the persecution happens after Stephen's martyrdom, and that's when they all get pushed out and they go start taking the the gospel other places. And we see it again here, very kind of simple concept. What else did you pick up through there? Yeah. Yeah. It, it certainly attracted attention. People who would go and see, well, I wonder what's going on. What, what's everybody so upset about? You know. Yeah. I do feel sorry for Jason. Jason just being a good host, being a nice guy. He's about to get beat up because he just, you know, he let these guys in his house. And I find it interesting that there was no need to use it at this point in time to fully worship. Yeah. Or any of these things that Paul talked about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's, you know, you see things changing. It's not just 
oh, that was a nice message, and I let them go on. Things were actually materially different at that point. Yeah. Uh huh. The pronoun changes. Yeah. yeah, and that's where scholars say this is when Luke joined the mission. That if if we take that Luke wrote Acts, one of the things that New Testament scholars often identify are what's called the we passages of Acts, and this is the first of those we passages, and it just happened suddenly. It's like this is happening. They 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 were doing this. Paul and Bar they were doing this. Paul and Silas were doing that. We left to go to, and that's probably when Luke joins the journey. And so he's with them at that point. So it is that, that moment where it's expanding to more people, too, because now there's a we. It's not just a they. And there are more people involved in, in the story and in what's going on. Another thing that happens is, again, this change in venue. You know, that's what it talks about when he's in Athens. He's in the synagogue. He goes to the synagogue. He's debating with people in the synagogue. But where does he also go? He goes to the marketplace. He's no, it's no longer just in the places of worship. Now he's out in the marketplace. And he's preaching the gospel there. In part because they're too stubborn at the synagogue. And he goes out and he encounters... I love that description of Athenian society. They just stand around contemplating. You know, they're just all philosophizing all the time. That's all they do. Stand around and philosophize. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Lydia, that's right. Yeah, we, at this point, is both male and female. Yeah. Lydia is the leader of the Philippian church. Who, by the way, is Paul's favorite church? He writes a love note to them in the New Testament. And, you know, the letter to the Philippians is just a really long thank you note. And he's, he really loves that church. Exactly. Okay, anything else? Yeah, yeah, he, he had the ability to move in and out of those different places. You know, speak, speaking this language here, this language here, this language here. He had the ability to, to, to move around, not literally different languages, but the, but the vocabulary of the moment. Yes. So the Holy Spirit's leadership is here, but it looks different, doesn't it? Because it was, we're going, we're going, we're going. This time was not here. No, no, not there. Not there. I think sometimes we always think that, that the Spirit always leads positively. That the Spirit only leads us to something. When sometimes the Spirit's there going, Stop! Do not go this way. This is not where you need to be. I need you over here. And so it, that is a change the second time around. Okay? What else? Yeah, there are more signs and wonders. Yeah, that, that does it end. That keeps going, Right? Right? There's some repeat visits. And, and he's doing again what he was doing on the way home. There's, there's that sense of discipling. He's, he's making sure they have leadership, that they're organized. Also notice that in the middle of the whole thing, when he gets to Corinth, he stops and does a little tent making. Because he, he meets, you know, meets some friends and they say, he, uh, he's got to do a little, he's got to replenish the supplies. Arguably, he's doing that along. 
But the idea is that it's not, it's not get up in the morning, go to the marketplace, go to, he's doing other things. It's part of his life. This mission is Paul's life. It's not, you know, I always thought it was interesting we talk about it as a mission trip, you know, Paul's missionary journey. It's his life. He's just moving from place to place, but it's what he does, it's who he is. Okay, so here's your homework. How does this translate for us? How do, how do we see a pattern for our engagement in God's mission in the world out of the way Paul engaged in God's mission in the world? So that's your homework. What can we learn from that? What, what pattern starts to emerge about how we to, are to engage in God's mission? So maybe we then can take that pattern and lay it over where we are and go, oh, we can see avenues. We can see possibilities. We can see opportunities. Okay? That's your homework. Don't skip out next week just because you don't have your homework. I know how that can be. End of the semester. Don't have my homework. I'm just not going to class. I still have cuts left. All that kind of thing. And we'll see what we can make of this together. As we kind of wrap up, next week what we're going to be doing is taking a look at everything we've talked about with the book of Acts and saying, okay, how does it provide a model for us today? How how do we understand we as a church are to function today based on how that first generation of the church developed? What does it teach us about what the church today ought to look like? We, you know, I've grown up my whole life hearing, you know, we're a, we're a new Testament church. Well, this is the new Testament church. Yeah, that's it. This is the pattern. So how do we how do we live out of that? So that's what we're going to be talking about next week. Yes, sir. There you go. Yeah, Let's pray and we'll go. God, for the opportunity to be in your house with your people studying your word tonight, we are grateful. And we pray that what it has spoken into us will become reality as we go out and try to live in our own way, in our own everyday lives, not just here in the church, but also out in the marketplace, doing the work that we need to do to survive each day, but also the work that is your work in the world as we go. So we pray for your blessings on us, that we would be obedient to the leadership of the Holy Spirit wherever it may take us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good night.